what your TBBS is capable of. <laughs> but even power that is easy to control can be intimidating when you first try to use it. Fear not. While TBBS has power and flexibility to spare, with just a little knowledge and practice, you'll be well on your way to creating exactly the BBS you want. Hi, I'm Phil Becker, the creator of TBBS. We all remember what it was like to be that student driver and to feel that unique combination of terror and excitement. It didn't take long for driving that car to feel as natural as breathing. But on that first day, you probably wondered how you would ever do it. That same feeling returns every time we start to use any powerful new technology. And while the concept of a BBS is very simple, to design the multi-user BBS you want and make it operate reliably, you're going to have to control some of the most complicated aspects of the computer art. And once you learn how to use TBBS, you'll find that it leverages your power to design bulletin boards the same way your automobile leverages your power to travel. <laughs> when bulletin boards started to, in mass, charge for their services, the controversy was free or pay, free or pay. And the free guys, the hobbyists, were outraged because the guys who got pay could afford better equipment, they could afford new phone lines. So these commercial BBSs started growing in power and in subscribership. And the hobbyist guys said, you know, this isn't fair. This was, this was all started, this was like ham radio. We were supposed to be all just friends here. And you guys are breaking the silent pact that we had with the group. That's where you lost the hobbyist aspect. That's where you lost that heart that I felt was there. Uh, I did it. I ran a bulletin board for for years just for the love of look at what I can do. I can hook all this stuff up, make it talk, make it do all this. And then you always had somebody coming in going, how can we make money? If you're running a business, great. Tell me about it before. Tell me when I step in the door. Tell me when I log in that it's a business because that way I'll leave because that's not what I'm in it for. I'm in it for the information. We've sowed the seeds of our own destruction, especially when the guys started wanting to charge money for bullet boards. It was something that, you know, it was a hobby. It was my hobby. It was my computer. I was going to take that machine down when I wanted to play with the computer. I was going to pull the plug on the motor. No question about it. And to expect somebody to pay for my hobby, they weren't friendly anymore. They weren't people talking with people anymore. They were people talking with businesses. Um, if you were to talk with somebody about something, you were you were talking to a hired mouthpiece. Basically, you're talking to people that have a policy and an agenda to uh, to speak and. That's what they're supposed to talk about, and it's not human anymore. And they all wanted 15 or 20 bucks a month. You could rapidly run out of money. So I think the charge boards 
started the downfall of bulletin boarding. And, and really, to be honest, um, I don't remember ever seeing a pay board that had anything unique on it. You know, like they had, they had a, a gigantic selection of uh, online games, or they had a gigantic selection of news feeds, or they had uh, multiple, they had 20 lines or something like that. There were people that were trying to charge to get some money back for it, um, but I wouldn't have paid to belong to VBS. For the most part, I didn't really see the, the services as benefiting the, the user. I mean, the idea, or at least for me, was to, to have a good time and to learn something. And if someone else can have a good time and benefit from that knowledge, then everybody's getting you know, payment out of that, if you want to call it that. I never charged a dime to gain access to the bulletin board, and I always said that the day I have to charge for it is the day I pull the plug. There have been times when I've, you know, gone to the pawn shop on the behalf of SDF to pay for phone bills and things like that. I did have a couple of users that you know would actually send 20 bucks every once in a while or something to help, just in general, to help keep it going. And a lot of bulletin board systems ran on uh, donations. And even this one, when I booted it up the other day, take a look at it, it says, yes, please donate to the BBS, $1, $5. The way I approached it was, for the first five years, I basically ran it as a freebie. Nobody, anyone that came on could not pay anything, from about 85, 86, and increasing from one line to four lines, and eventually up to 16 tele physical telephone lines, and having a three-figure phone bill, I decided, hey, we're going to have to put some kind of price tag on people having unlimited access. That really was the sole purpose of writing it, it was just for my own use. The fact that other people eventually became interested in it and it did in fact get sold to some people wasn't really part of my original plan. I, I, um, the, the idea was never to go mass market with it. Yeah, I mean, it was only because I was at the right place at the right time with the right idea. That's always how it works in anything. Packaged it up and sold the first 1.0 TVBS. I could not imagine at that time that there was a market for us. Originally, it was not built to sell at all. I didn't want to sell Synchronet at all at first. It was certainly not a commercial venture. What changes your mind? Uh, well, there were sysops that were, like, begging me to give me money. I think I said 400 copies in 10 years or something like that. Well, it turns out that by the end of a year and a half, he'd sold way more than whatever my number was that I said at the time. It was actually starting to make me some significant money on the side. 1989, that's that's when I left my day job and went to work for Clark Development and made it a, a, a full-time job for me. Uh, prior to that, we were doing a lot of work on the side after hours, during lunch, People would send in checks. I was really surprised. You know, I'd go to my mailbox and there was a check. What we really found was that charging, uh, you know, what the product was worth really, uh, I think, inspired people to pay for it. Uh, once they saw that we were standing behind the product, that we were putting it forward, uh, supporting it, uh, and enhancing it and so on portraying the image that it was worth that. No, actually in the manual it says at the end uh, that we had dreams of being rich and famous, but we knew that we weren't going to be rich, so we may as well be famous. Exec PC was a reasonable size bulletin. Actually, it was a very large bulletin board system in those days. Um, when I joined, I'm going to say that we're probably... 150, 200 lines, and probably 8,000 customers. Bob Mahoney, the, uh, the founder of ExecPC, would 
sell his used hard drives and I would go over to his house occasionally and purchase one of his used hard drives. And so we got to be pretty friendly. So in about 91, 92, I got a call from Bob saying he'd like to talk to me. He said, I can never go on vacation because, you know, I'm away from the system and, you know, it'll crash. And it's just, it wasn't reliable enough that he could go away for extended periods of time and he was actually burning out. So he said he was looking to expand his team. It was just he and his wife, Tracy, and he made me an offer. I initially said, well, I'm going to have to think about it. And I drove home, and I remember standing up in my living room and saying, what the hell do I have to think about? That's exactly what I want to do. And I called him up and I said, of course I'm going to take this. There's no, there's no question that I want this job. It was like a dream come true. Um, there were all these software guys that I, that I hung around with in the Milwaukee area. And this was the dream job. We were having so much fun. I couldn't wait to get to the office every day. It was about a half hour drive from my home here over to there and uh, it gave me uh, half an hour to, to uh, figure out what I was going to do the whole day and I just arrived at the office with a big smile on my face every morning because we were in unchartered territory. We were doing some really cool stuff and having a blast doing it and I was being paid reasonably well. So, I mean, there wasn't a happier guy in Milwaukee. The whole economic model of having a commercial BBS was um, suspect because you need to reach a certain critical mass before you can just keep it going. And once you start to grow, you need to get another computer, another phone line, another piece of software to run the next node. So you're taking yesterday's subscriptions to fund today's expansion. So unless you keep expanding and expanding and expanding, you, your business model just falls on its face. We got a whole slew of articles, all kinds of magazines saying, this is the path to get rich quick. Start a BBS and get rich quick. All you have to do is buy a computer, which at that time was about five grand. You buy this computer and you plug in a phone line and people call into your computer and they give you money for it. It's like you don't have to have any real skill. You just have to have a phone line and a computer and people will send you money. No, stop, wait. No, it's not like that at all. You've got to have a rather exceptional level of computer skill. You have to go beyond that to understand the software. It was not easy. What somebody discovered is if you put a few pictures of naked people online and have this section, this sex section of your bulletin board, people would pay money to get access to it. Certain boards 
not usually certain types, but certain boards would give you uh, the there was there was a feeling this board is pretty scummy, or the people on this board tend to be uh, slimy in their business dealings. You, you just never wanted to do anything with in business with them. Uh, there was always this vibe of, okay, I've just shaken hands with you and let me wipe the oil off. The, the time when a BBS could charge, I, I think, I think BBS is when they did charge money. They were offering either porn or wares. And, and BBSs basically couldn't charge for anything else. It really brought to my attention how big the basically the porn industry was in the PBS community. You know, you'd see it. You'd see it the few times that that uh, the few times that you'd see bulletin boards mentioned in the in the media and the mass media, you know, big newspapers and stuff. Probably half the time it was, hey, these CD BBSs are places where guys download porn. You know, that was the image that our business was getting from that. My world at that point was I had an office, which was about, it was about 400 square feet. Uh, we had fluorescent lights. It took me like a year and a half to go out and buy a couple halogen lamps. We had a lot of computer equipment and modems and a bong and a refrigerator with beer in it and, you know, 100 phone lines. And I can remember at times I would take a call from a customer or something that usually they sit there and say, well, your job is to sit there all day and work with bulletin boards. Wow, that'd be great, you know. And I, and I, I came up with a standard line eventually because I got that so often. I'd say, you know, if my job was to do nothing but make love to beautiful women all day long, sooner or later I'd find something wrong with it. <laughs> There's always a downside to anything. Most of the time I spent behind my desk at Mustang was on the phone talking to people, uh, trying to figure out their problems and letting them scream and yell and, and gripe and moan and do whatever they needed to do to make them feel better about not getting the support they needed initially. Uh, I dealt with a lot of screaming people. Uh, there was at least one episode I remember where a guy threatened to shoot me with a shotgun if I didn't uh, if I didn't fix a bug that he thought was uh, was my fault in search like BBS. So. Was it your fault? I, yeah, I, I I don't remember. I mean, it was probably a bug, and it, it, maybe it was a bug, but I don't know. It, it, you sure whatever, the whatever it was, it wasn't worth shooting me for. <laughs> so you certainly probably weren't inspired by the threat of death to. Uh, <laughs> No, I think I just stopped taking that guy's calls. <laughs> I remember one customer in particular, he, he was, I'm sure, frustrated in that we were unable to duplicate his problem, even though it kept happening to him. And so he finally got out his video camera. He videotaped the problem in action, sent it to us, and bang! I mean, then we knew exactly what to do. I remember sitting in my office uh, saying, you know, I'll try, I'd gladly trade 5% of my health to, uh, you know, get to have a, have this be a success, this release, and do sales and all that. And voila, I did trade 5%. I'm a diabetic now. So, you know, probably attributed to not getting much exercise and things like that. And there was a time where all of us in tech support we actually faked all the engineers into coming outside for a group photo. And what we told them was going to be a group photo and turned it to be a uh, water balloon fest on them. <laughs> we got you back now. <laughs> but to see it on the shelf of a store, it really changed things. It brought it into, it, it, you know, created it into a business and I think it got it into more people's hands which exponentially grew the population of BBSs. A lot of people uh, in, in growing up through school and stuff, talking about bulletin boards at school with people that I knew, 
They had no idea what a bulletin board is or why you'd have one or why somebody would even call your computer. And when it, once it appeared on the shelves, people saw, oh, I can do all this and more. I can do that too. And I think a lot of this has to go with the fact that, yeah, I mean, just bulletin board system development is something that anyone who is developing that software or having almost any role in those companies, they love bulletin board systems. I mean, it's something they felt passionate about. And to work on those sorts of projects to be a part of making that happen, yeah, that doesn't just become a job. That really does become something that they pay you to do it. I mean, that's a really nice bonus, but if they weren't paying you, I mean, you'd be at home, like, doing this on your own anyway. I think I probably had an exaggerated sense of responsibility, um, and it may have come from the fact that a lot of the customers were hobbyist customers. Where it was, it, it, to them, it was more than just they bought a product from a company. To them, they were sort of joining into this to this group or to this, uh, you know, this, this faction of bulletin boards that ran Searchlight BBS. So when we first started out, it was basically Fred and I working together, but then when we went full time, we had a, a staff of two additional employees, I think is what we had, working out of his basement. And, and really, it, it was a pretty humble beginnings. Um, from there, we, we grew, I think, up to as many as 30 people at one point. And, and so, yeah, it, it was interesting to see the growth over time and say, you know, wow, what we're doing is, is really what's driving the company. I had a reaction to some, some of those mm -hmm. kinds of trends going on in the industry. It used to be that I could call XYZ company and I could say, you know, Henry, you got a problem. This is what's going on and I can duplicate it. Mm -hmm. You've got this bug and Henry go, oh my God, you know, to where now, hi Henry, it's Peter. Well, that's great. Talk to my technical guy. You know, you, you got shoved away. The, the old camaraderie yeah. of the small circle of people went away. When TBBS said, we are now real. We have now arrived. Instead of selling to George, we want to sell to Baxter Medical. That's a, uh, a question that I think you'll find is not different here than it is everywhere. And that is, something has a purity about it that should not be sullied by even accepting money if people want to give it to you. I am a radical free marketeer, and I believe that marketplaces are the best way to tell what has value and what doesn't. Because I think it's, the, uh, it's a test. As an engineer, it's just like putting a meter on something, in my view. You can tell yourself what counts and pretty much make anything sound like it counts. But when other people tell you it counts, they can tell you a couple of ways. They can tell you with words, which are cheap, or they can write checks, which say it really does count. And so I'm very much a believer that money doesn't sully anything. It, it ratifies it. In my world, or Phil's world, uh, economics and uh, money and capitalism and entrepreneurship is how you sort out the winners from the losers. If you have a product and a hundred people will give you ten bucks for it, and then a thousand people will give you ten bucks for it, it must be of some value. Otherwise, why would they do it? If you have a product that's free and uh, uh, nothing comes of it, and you don't even know how many people are using it, what was it?
Once I started getting a publication called Board Watch by Jack Ricker, all of a sudden you have a monthly publication that literally lists thousands. My brother called me and he said, hey, I found this magazine. Um, you know, they're, they're totally advertising BBS software and everything. And, and I was like, what? And I couldn't believe there's a magazine about BBS. Board Watch Magazine, in the beginning, I just loved when it appeared, it was like a dream come true. And I read every issue from front to back. I remember the first time one of my systems made Board Watch. That was an experience. That was almost like the, uh, the old song about making the cover of the Rolling Stone. And for a, a sysop, being on the Board Watch Top 100 list was big time. Made it. Yeah, I think Board Watch magazine made me start to feel guilty about operating. You know, it, it felt like I'm supposed to be making, you know, supposed to be making money out of this. <laughs> the character of Board Watch was the character tag. It, it was him through and through. <laughs> he was evident all the way through the magazine. His choice of writers, his choice of style. The way it looked was was Jack. He, he was he was such a elegant writer. He just and he he was so um, non corporate in his ways. You know, he's one of those guys that got hate mail and only quite wanting to change was the subject. <laughs> Pretty much from the start, being opinionated was uh, almost a professional gig. If I didn't have an opinion about it, it didn't cause any reaction in me and probably wasn't important that no one would be interested in it. And if it did, I'd go ahead and put it in there. There was no uh, pretense of any real objectivity. It was this guy's developed this and it's a stupid thing and it shouldn't be done and he won't last six months. He had a smile on his face. That's what I'll, I'll, I'll say that about Rickard. He was uh, he was a pretty happy guy. He was a force um, on Galacticon that I sort of looked like our other competitors. Is it wasn't always a friendly force. Um, in fact, sometimes I'd say it was a downright hostile force. Um, but it was a force that nonetheless made us stop and address issues and perspectives that we wouldn't have necessarily been paying attention to. But he was one of those those sort of voices out there that just did not support bullshit. You know, other things being equal, it'd sure be good if Jack thought good things about us. Um, to which, uh, yeah, I think I spent many, many years off of my life, you know, uh, trying to uh, have Jack think good things about Galacticon. Uh, in some cases, I was successful, and in some cases, I was not. You get into these enormous flame wars, and Jack was famous for them. Oh my god, Jack was famous for them. Somebody would send him an email that he didn't like, and he would not only flame them, he would flame them in his column, which we printed all of the emails that he got that he wanted to print, was an enormously popular section of Boardwatch magazine. But Jack just ran amok with a bloody sword at times. And he could do it, he could skewer people, and people loved to watch that. But it didn't add to our ability to get along together, or work together, or even to confront really important issues. If I tell you that this wireless 802.11G um, item that I'm looking at right now will do a 54 megabit beta rate, um, that's sort of a dry kernel of information. If I adopt a position on whether it should do it at all, it's a little bit 
easier to convey in a entertaining fashion, one that you'll remember. And if I describe to you the politics of how they came to that encoding scheme and who the guy is that did this and why he was almost knifed by his own employer because that wasn't really the politic thing to do at the time. But what will cause you to read it is my opinion on it and, and a story about a person. You know, it was funny with the BBS world and this concept of competitors. Um, I know we all got into it, and uh, certainly Galacticom uh, tried to compete very vigorously with uh, uh, Esoft and uh, Mustang, uh, but that was really a case where it was a rising tide lifting all boats. Uh, there were very few cases where I think we were taking customers away from each other. When you're on the field, you actually are trying to kill the guy across from you, but at the same time, if he kills you instead, you admire him for having done it. You know, like going out playing football, um, uh, you know, where afterwards, you know, everyone can go get a beer, and you both will go out afterwards and buy each other a drink and be great friends. And it wasn't bitter. It wasn't like, um, you know, uh, we really need to get those guys. The, the whole BBS industry was large enough for all of us to profit, all of us to to benefit from it, so it wasn't a real competitive industry. It wasn't a real cutthroat business, if you will. It was. It, it still stayed friendly, even in the in, in the in the marketing of it, in the sales. It was kind of a friendly competition, kind of thing. I mean, it, it was more like it, it wasn't like stomp on the other guy. It was like one up him so that he could one up you, so that you could one up him, and, and just kind of. Both of you are improving each other by way of competition. We were just trying to show each other up on innovations and wow, what a, just what an incredible force that was. And yeah, I think competition did a lot of good for everyone who was in that commercial sector. The BBS Con uh, trade show uh, was uh, entirely Phil Becker's idea, actually. As he says, I, I dragged him kicking and screaming into it, something he's been thankful for ever since. It's the way he'll phrase it, I suspect, when you talk to him. He had to get me down to the floor and arm wrestle me to make it happen. The evolution of BBS Con was I wanted to do one from the time that I did my second TBBS, which was bringing just my own users of, of the software that I had created together. And, and I said to myself, this is something that everybody needs to be part of. This value is so high for this kind of interaction. But I didn't have a way to make it successful business, something that I will never start down a road unless I see a path to. But he was promoting the whole notion of these commercial conventions that he was going to, he saw himself, saw all these people that bought all this hardware, and he saw himself as having been able to found and find the next Condex, and he was going to be the linchpin of that. Uh, there were a number of uncomfortable elements about it for me. I uh, sat in a dark room in the Colorado mountains and wrote stuff and mailed it to people. Um, the show required me to get up and speak in front of them. Um, but Phil was the one that uh, really got that off the ground. Uh, he actually would come over to my house and talk about it endlessly. I finally gave him a check, said, okay, here's my half, let's go do it. And so we started out to do the first one in 92. And my goal from the very first was a thousand people. I said, I want to make a statement that this is really an industry, and it really has a constituency, and it really has an audience. 
because it's the only way we're going to get commercial people to pay us sponsorship fees and do boosts and make a, make a convention that pays its way. The biggest thing that was rewarding, uh, our, our initial innovation was, as you say, um, the meetings that they had had were in Howard Johnson's in Kansas, uh, where it would be cheap. I went to the first one. It was amazing. That's actually, here it is, what, um, 12, 12 years later, and that convention was still the best convention that I've ever been to in my life. It was held in Colorado Springs. It was very upscale, and it made the most expensive gathering that anybody, any bullet port system operator had ever attended. It was a five-star convention center, and it was first class all the way. I remember we were outside, the weather was gorgeous, and we were outside, and here come these waiters with trays of cookies, just delivering them to all the participants at this convention. Uh, they just cranial detonations at what the room prices were, the registration, everything about it was just entirely too expensive and no one would go. Except that actually a lot of people did go. In one of the big features of BBS Con, uh, BBS Cons to come, were the parties that various groups would have, uh, you know, I mean, uh, the Galacticon party uh, for all of our customers. I mean, we looked forward to that more than like any other aspect of those conventions. I went to a lot of uh, seminars and we had a big matrix of seminars a couple days long and, and I went to a couple seminars and, you know, basically it was just people talking about how to grow your BBS and, and new services, what attracts callers and so forth, and it, it was a lot of fun, and it was also very informative. The six months leading up to BBSCon was this incredibly intense time inside Galactica, where like everyone in engineering and marketing, I mean, we were all focused on how can we just blow everyone out of the water at this next show. And, I mean, what a phenomenal force for, like, just encouraging innovation. The first thing that impressed me is that there was a business there. A lot of people were selling equipment to other people who wanted to run uh, boiling board systems. Uh, the second was uh, the fact that there was a magazine that was uh, devoted to boiling board systems. And Jack clearly figured out the formula for, uh, for taking advantage of that. And, and the thing is, we brought Vint and Surf to BBSCon not to talk about BBSs. I don't even know if he'd ever heard of one before he got there. Uh, we brought him there to have him tell the audience what was getting ready to happen to their to communications and computers. And our goal was every year we wanted somebody to come into one of those tabletop booths and the next year see him with a company that was making him money and paying him a salary. And we did that repeatedly. Every year we saw that. I would go to those conventions just to see what was going on out there. The first couple or first few conventions I actually went with a booth. And you know, after I think the second or third one, we just said, you know, what are we trying to do here? Kind of singing to the choir. And it was sort of like, well, we know there's a market for all of this stuff, and God knows there are zillions of BBSers, but what will we do with this? And so they really didn't know. We would see a lot of our old customers, but everybody knew about us, and so we weren't really gaining any new customers by having a booth there. I, I was okay with because it was 
it kind of harkened back to the early West Coast computer fairs. You've got all these, the innovators and, and that are out there, you know, showing their new stuff. Uh, but, you know, past about that second year, it started to feel really commercial. You know, it's not, we're not doing it for doing it anymore. We're doing it because we can make money at it. And that's where I started to kind of go, Um, yeah, I think l l most of the smaller guys got short shrift. I think uh, uh, Searchlight, to a large degree, and uh, Robo, the Robo FX guy was there, and, and he had a very impressive uh, display. I mean, we'd go to these, you know, we'd go to the BBS cons, you know, we'd spend a lot of money to get to BBS con, we'd set up this booth, we'd have, uh, you know, truckloads of, of equipment that we'd bring in, it cost a lot of money, took a lot of time. You know, and, and who would walk up to my booth is not some guy with, you know, $10,000 to spend on, on a solution for his online services, but, you know, Joe BBS guy from New Jersey saying, you know, you got something you can sell me for 35 bucks that's going to let me talk to my friends online. That was, that was a little disappointing. Well, I, I just think there was a conflict of interest. I think, you know, the people that are writing the articles are the same people that, uh, you know, are, are best friends with or own, you know, part of the, com the competition. So they're not going to, you know, give a fair share to each company. You know, they, they, it was unethical. Uh, most things never really paid off for us. I know they must have paid off for somebody because they were, you know, they had them every year and people would go, so... You know, they obviously had something against us, so the fact that they did and they're in bed with Jack Rickard means that, you know, they're not going to do anything to help promote our software. So, you know, there was some uh, conflict of interest there for sure. You know, at, at, at a certain point in there, we probably spent more time with each other than with anybody else, both of us. But the truth is, that wasn't going to make any difference. The only edge it gave me was I could get his attention to ask him to look at something. But once he looked, it's going to be his outlook that got, it wasn't going to be mine. I wasn't going to be able to influence it. If the fix was in, um, Phil Becker and TBBS, I can assure you, would have wound up owning all of bulletin boards in the internet. But they didn't. If somebody beat me, he was going to say they beat me, and it wasn't a problem, and it was not going to be that way. Now, early on, I think that wasn't necessarily so well known, but Jack became very clearly known amongst this community quickly as somebody, you know, nobody is going to tell Jack anything but what Jack wants to say is only who's going to come out of his mouth. They both wanted to make a buck at it. Jack with the magazine and Phil, of course, with his software company, and both did. Both were tremendously successful. And uh, I don't know what their relationship was. I knew they were close friends at the time, and they seemed to be in cahoots with an awful lot of the stuff that, uh, that both produced. And it was good. It was a good symbiosis. It, it worked. There is nothing permanent in computers. Everything has a life cycle. And don't fall in love with any part of it so deeply that you can't make it a comfortable part of your past. Once the internet, I would say about the mid-95, early 96, is when I started to see a drop-off in callership. Here's the deal. I kind of feel like I'm telling people to get ready for this thing that's coming. And I'm describing a tsunami, and since it's four inches tall out in the Pacific, they come down with buckets. It's going to wipe out you know, the beach. Instead of embracing the internet, I made the comment to my wife, oh, this is a new thing, it'll go away in a couple of years. You know, it's like... Okay, you know, you live and learn. Once it started to become ISP watch <laughs> instead of board watch is when I, I was really turned off by it because 
that shift started to happen before the BBS scene had died. There was this huge division drawn by the participants um, between the internet and bulletin board systems. I was tone deaf to that. It, it looked like the same thing to me. Uh, since, as I say, we covered the internet from 87 or 88, and bullet boards from about the same time. Um, I didn't realize how divided our audience was. Not anything against board watch at all, but as they were making a, a business decision. But I was disappointed in how quickly the lack of PBS coverage it just disappeared in like 96 and 97. And I really think the people that I had in mind as our readership, it was. Uh, so that, that division between the dial up over the telephone lines and the internet was dialed up over the I still don't quite get the division. Mustang was falling apart. One of the one of the worst days of my life, I'll never forget it, was walking in, into my QA lab and my guys were already at work and they read me the headlines of that day, which was, you know, quit quit to send us a new agreement to purchase Mustang software. And from that day forward I knew it was over. The, the Mustang that I grew up with that I knew was done. I mean the day came I think it was like May thirteenth. It was a Monday, so you'd have to check your calendar and it was towards the middle of May. And uh, we got about three hours in and he just came in and said, you can keep working, but I can't pay you any further than this very moment. And he wrote a handwritten check for, like, I think it was the new pay period, three hours. It was uh, rather sad. To see that, uh, I knew Fred, I knew David Terry well, I consider David a friend. Uh, I, David had removed himself from day-to-day uh, -day operations in CDC by that time, but just being connected, associated with it, you know. I didn't like to see how it went down. A lot of people lost orders. Uh, confidence in the industry, which of course by then was pretty much dying anyway, that's why it happened. We all got, eventually got laid off. Um, there's still a core group of, of Mustang people over the years to keep in touch, email, chats, the, the like. Um, when Larry and I finally eventually got laid off from the, the company that eventually ended up buying the company that bought Mustang. Um, we had a meeting where they basically told the engineering department that they were laying everybody off and there was only a few people left and they had another meeting saying well they're laying everybody else off. I didn't even get out of the meeting before and to my desk before I, I actually literally had voicemails, people calling on my cell phone people leaving me, I instant messages going, is it true? Did you actually get laid off? I mean, literally, within seconds, people were, you know, from across the country, you know, friends from, from you know, in, in Georgia and Texas going, dude, I heard you got laid off. that were running my phone mostly, not technical innovators, not entrepreneurs. Uh, people were raising a hundred million dollars on a 16-page 
paper plan for something that was goofy if it was done. It was a stupid idea and nobody needed um, At that point, you know, I'm kind of out of here. It's, you know, it's a different thing. The, the townies have moved in. We're not on the prairie here. There's no Dodge City. Right? This is all townies. Um, and so they don't need me, and, uh, and I'll move along and go find something more interesting. Did Jim Stutter do come and ask you to go to it? Would you go to it? In a heartbeat, no question. Not even an option. Not, it, yeah. You know, it's sort of funny is um, all the time that Galacticon was starting to grow as a company, we really had this deep-seated belief that this was the future. That in the next 10 years, and this was back in the early 90s, we were convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt that within the next 10 years, this concept of people network together through computers. Um, I mean, that was going to be it. That was the way lives were going to evolve. And it was fascinating that we could be so right and so wrong at the same time. It was great. You know, I, I look back at six years of, of challenge and fun, and, and, and all I can do is smile. You know, I just, just a big roller coaster. So, I enjoyed it quite a bit. The way I look at it these days is looking back on it, I like to tell people I made the world's best boogie boots. We did real well. Um, you know, I did. My house, Larry's house, a lot of people we managed to, you know, sell some of the stock options we had, um, sell some of the, you know, stock that we bought, and, you know, got into homes. I, I certainly didn't think I'd be in a position like it, you know, right now. And that was because of EPS. It really was. I would hope the people who worked at Galacticom, the people who ran Galacticom systems, and even to a certain degree the people who were callers into these systems, um, yeah, that they would remember the positive things that brought into their life. I mean, I, I remember the time that I got a call from a customer uh, who called me up and just said, and I'm not going to use their name because of the, when you hear the story, you'll understand why, but uh, called me up and said, uh, Phil, I, I just have to thank you for what you've done. And of course, when a call starts that way, you never quite know what's going to happen. But you know, I, I said, okay, and what was that? He said, well, when I came across your software, I had been spending a week with a pistol every day trying to decide whether I should make it to tomorrow or end it. And I saw your software and it opened up a world to me being online and being on this BBS and he says, and you know, I've never looked back and never had those thoughts again. Uh, well, it was, it was my wife. I actually ate my family and uh, everything else. Uh, I worked uh, typically 12 to 16 hours a day, seven days a week for many years uh, without a day off. Uh, I lived it, breathed it, ate it, and loved it. And loved every minute of it.